Hey everybody, it's April here, and I just want to bring you something um, different. This morning is 8.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and I have got my breakfast and my breakfast. Mm. And so I wanted to invite you to breakfast and the word. Um, and whenever I start talking, for some reason, my dog starts whining. Do you hear that? So I'm going to let him out. Listen, nothing about... Um, Facebook lives for me are professional, obviously. There they go. So I want to share a quick word of encouragement with you today um, called uh, keep building, keep fighting. Keep building, keep fighting. So Lord, we just come before you this morning and God, during this time together, I pray that your name is glorified. I pray, Lord Jesus, that anyone that needs to be encouraged to keep building, to keep fighting, Lord, is led to this, um, to this um, Facebook Live, to this video. Holy Spirit, you're the one that has the genius power of heaven. Lord, there's nothing in my mind that is powerful. There's nothing that I can share of wit or knowledge that can help anyone. But I pray the Holy Spirit speaks something today to each heart, to touch their heart, to encourage them, to stoke the fire in them, to light them on fire again for Jesus, for the kingdom of God, to remind them the God that they serve. And Lord, if they don't yet serve you, to show them the God that you are, Lord, the true Jesus, full of love, full of grace, but full of power, Lord. So I just worship you this morning. And I pray that this word goes out like seed planted in good hearts, good soil. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody doing good this morning? I'm doing great. So this morning, I actually um, flipped open to 2 Samuel and chapter 3. And if anyone wants to put that in the feed, that would be like amazing, but no pressure there. 2 Samuel chapter 3. And this verse just leapt off the page at me. I love when the Holy Spirit does this. So listen to what the word says here in 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. This one verse is so amazing. It says this. Now there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. Have you ever felt like you've been in battle forever? Have you ever felt like as soon as you seem to win one battle, the next one comes in riding on its coattails? Um, I think we're all there, right? In some form or fashion with what's just been going on in our world. But then individually as well, I feel like there are attacks, there are assaults, there are strategies that are executed against us as children of God. So here David would represent the children of God, of course. David was coming into his throne, his rule, and Saul was on the way out. So um, actually, Saul, this was the house of Saul. So the house of Saul was on its way out. And I feel like in our lives, a lot of times there's areas in our life where the enemy has had power in the past. He's had victory over us in the past. And the Lord is ushering in victory for us. And that's like this transfer that was occurring between David and the house of David and the house of Saul. So there was literally a, a civil war in Israel between those two houses. So, so let me repeat that again. Now, now, that's the word, right? This is happening now to many of us. Now, there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. If I just stopped there, that would be, be very depressing. Oh, yes, a long war, a long battle. But, but there is a semicolon there. So I'm going to keep reading. Amen. And if somebody can put 2 Samuel 3, chapter, 2 Samuel 3, verse 1 in the feed, that would be amazing. 2 Samuel 3 and verse 1. There was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. And David grew steadily stronger. But I love it says and David, but Saul. It's like, I don't know. I, I love even that, even the choice of those um, words, and David grew steadily stronger. The word is like being added to, and David grew steadily stronger, but the house of Saul grew weaker continually. The house of Saul grew weaker continually. Keep up the good fight of faith. That's my encouragement to you today. 
Keep up the good fight of faith. The Word of God doesn't say fight a fight of your goodness. So, so really fight strong to try to be good enough. Or fight the fight of your righteousness. Or even fight the fight to read more Bible than anyone else. Thank you, Damien. It says, fight the good fight of what? Faith. 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 So, I entitled this this um, video, Breakfast with the Word, because we eat the Word for our spirit and we eat food for our body. But, it's called Building and Fighting. Keep building, keep fighting. So, what do I mean about keep building and keep fighting? David was fighting to build a kingdom in Israel that would be a kingdom patterned after what God wanted it to be, not what Saul wanted it to be. So he was trying to build something and Satan didn't like that. So let's go to Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter, well, the whole book of Nehemiah. We're not going to read it. I'm just going to tell you. Nehemiah is an amazing book. You need to go there and read it if you haven't yet. Nehemiah was in exile. Israel was overrun. Um, the Israelites, for the most part, were taken into exile, but there were a few left there in Jerusalem. So Nehemiah, this, this is years later, he actually has favor, and he is the cupbearer to this foreign king that they are in exile to. kind of reminds me of Daniel and Joseph, how they both were in prominent positions in exile. Um, there's a whole thing there. God will put you in a prominent position in a hard land. But anyways, Nehemiah finds out that Israel has been ransacked, that the walls of the both the city and of the temple are rubble, and it breaks his heart. And so <clears throat> that would represent the temple of God in that day. That would represent the place that is built by man to house God. And I want you to see the spiritual parallels in our life that we build a place of worship that we build altars, although those altars aren't seen and they're not made with wood and nails. It's in our heart. It's, it's a place in the spiritual that we actually build. So he found out it was in ruin and this broke his heart. And he says, man, I want to rebuild this thing. And so through a series of events, God makes, um, makes a path for him to be able to go back with provision. God gives you everything you need, y'all. Nehemiah had everything he needed. The people, the money, the supplies. The, the gung-ho-ness, he had everything he needed. So whatever you need to build what God's called you to build, you have it. God's given it to you. Hallelujah. So he goes and he starts to gather people and they're starting to build. And of course, can you imagine what's going to happen? Will the enemy be so happy that this is occurring? No, not at all. So we find a man named Sanballat and there is so, so much. I'm looking for my phone. I'm on my phone to, to show you some of the meanings. But listen, the name Sanballat, who was his enemy, his name means this, empowered or healed by sin. Empowered or healed by sin. Now, we're going to play on words here because that sin actually means the moon god that they used to worship, but it's the same word as sin. So, your enemy in your life wants to come and stop you from building what God has called you to build. He's going to fight you. He's not going to be easy on you. If you're going to truly go forward in what Christ has called you to do, whether it is to do ministry or to do something in your community or just to have a devotional life with Jesus Christ, whatever you're going to be building, there's going to be a sand ballot. So here's my encouragement. Step one, when you walk in sin, you empower the enemy to come against you. And so do I. We, we enable our flesh to get stronger through sin and repeated sin and repetitious sin. And our flesh becomes partners with the enemy and says, come on in boys. So that's just for free. So here we go. What did sand ballot do? What did Sam Ballot do? He wanted to stop them from building, right? Correct. So I love how the King James puts it. It actually has seven different oppositions. So it says, step one, Sam Ballot, opposition through ridicule. So listen, the enemy's going to speak into your mind and tell you how foolish you are. He's going to try to ridicule whatever you're doing for God, whatever you're building for God. Satan's going to come with ridicule. But guess what? Nehemiah stood strong and prospered and was victorious. Second thing, opposition through threat of attack. 
Sanballat threatened to attack. The enemy does this to you. He says, yeah, you're going to do that for God. Let me tell you what I'm going to come at you with. Let me tell you what the threat that's going to be towards you. But it didn't matter. Uh, nevertheless, Nehemiah uh, made our prayer, made his prayer unto God, set a watch against them day and night because of them. So, Satan, you're behind me. Satan doesn't stop. Sanballat came opposition through discouragement. Do you know that the enemy, when you feel discouraged, that is the enemy. God never wants you to be discouraged even in, even in the valley of the shadow of death. He gives you joy, which is your strength. And it's not happiness, but it's a joy that's solid that lets you know, no matter what happens in this world, no matter what I lose in this world, I have a hope that is eternal. Hallelujah. So opposition through discouragement. Uh, he tried to come and discourage the people that were building. But listen, listen here. Nehemiah talking, talking to the people. But not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible and and fight for your brethren, for your sons, for your daughters, for your wives, for your houses. Hallelujah. And it came to pass when our enemies heard that it was known to us, basically that that was foiled. So discouragement leaves when we remember how great and terrible means awesome, how awesome our God is. And then he said, fight. He didn't say, just keep building. See, they were building a wall. They weren't actually going to war. But Nehemiah said, fight. For your brethren, for your sons, for your daughters, your wives, your homes. We have people that we're fighting for. And how did they fight? They got back on the wall and kept building. And had a sword in one hand and a hammer in the other. Hallelujah. Okay, praise God. So they did not, um, he did not win that way. Next, opposition through extortion. He tried to bribe them. This is where the enemy will come at you and me. And if our character is not solid, it may not be straight up bribery, but the enemy will come to an area of weakness in our character when we're trying to build for God. And he will exploit that issue. So if we're greedy, he'll try to make us, you know, greedy, angry, whatever the thing that he can extort. Of course, we know that, praise the Lord, um, this did not occur. I'm not going to read all the verses. It's really, really good. Nehemiah said, no, 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 no. Next, this is the fifth opposition. Wow. So are you telling me that like it wasn't just one battle and done? It's not always just slaying a Goliath. Sometimes it's easier to slay that one monumental um, Goliath opposition mountain that comes at us, that one big fight, than the seven little fights that keep coming. But the Bible says it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. So I want us to be aware that even when you finish this video, all of a sudden when you feel discouragement come, you're going to get a phone call or you might get a word of something or you might, you know, usually it's through hearing something here or here that causes these attacks. Um, I want you to stand and say, oh no, I'm building with God and I'm fighting for my family, for myself, I'm fighting the good fight of what? Faith. And what is faith, y'all? Let me tell you what I think faith is. Faith is not believing in God. That's important. Faith is believing God. It's a difference. Many of us believe in God. I believe in God. I believe in his power. I know he can do anything. But do I believe him? Because he said that he could do anything through me. So do I just believe in God or do I believe God? If I believe God, I will face every one of these oppositions and keep fighting the good fight of faith. Thank you, James. Hebrews 11, 1. Yes, hallelujah. Faith is substance. Faith is the substance of things unseen. So substance means real. It means it has a weight to it. It means that there's something to it. And then we read of all those people in Hebrews that walked in faith by believing God, not by being good enough, but by believing what he said and acting on what he said. Yes. All right, Nehemiah believed God. So next, um, the next opposition that came was the opposition through compromise. So, Satan couldn't get him through ridicule. He said, no, I don't care. You laugh at me all you want. Call me a fool. I'm going to keep building. Satan couldn't get him through threat of attack. I'm going to come after you. I'm going to get you. No, I'm not afraid. I've got a sword in my hand. I'll, I will 
I will cut you down. Satan couldn't get him through discouragement, which is incredible because that's usually where he gets most of us. He said, no, I'm going to stay encouraged in the Lord. I'm going to know that what I'm building, even though it seems like it's going to take forever, it's going to be so hard. I'm going to keep building because I'm encouraged in the Lord. Satan couldn't get him through extortion, so his character was, was clean. So the next one is opposition through compromise. So here's, here's what the compromise sounds like. Okay, God has called you to this. But really, I mean, you have five kids. You're a nurse. You're doing the radio program. You're already involved in ABCD. So how, So why don't you just do th this? Compromise. Because this is better than this. So I'm just going to do this. I'm not going to... Um, I'm not going to do this with my full zeal. I'm just tired. Um, I'm not going to, uh, you know, God's called us to pray for the sick and, oh, and do all these things, but I'm I just, I'm just spent. I'm not going to do it full heartedly. I'm not going to really like preach the gospel because it's offensive. So I'm just going to tell people God loves you. Hmm compromise. And if anyone has compromised, it has been the American church. You walk in most of our Americanized churches, sad, sad, sadly to say, and the power of God is nowhere to be seen in the room. You know, it reminds me of the New Testament where the high priest were still putting on all their garb, lighting all their incense, doing all their rituals, going in to the most holy place where when God had them build it, there were the, the Ark of the Covenant was there. And the presence of God was in that place. But guess what? Many years before the New Testament, the temple was ransacked. And the Ark of the Covenant was stolen. So literally, the high priests were going in and performing all of these rituals going behind that curtain and there was no Ark of the Covenant there. They were going about all the motions and they knew the Ark wasn't even there. Why didn't they go and run and fi fight to get back the presence of God? Because the presence of God was not of importance. What was of importance was the show. So that is what compromise looks like. Saying that, no, we don't need the Holy Spirit anymore. No, we don't need the gifts of the Spirit. No, we don't need to really preach the Word. We just need to worship. Or, no, we don't need to worship. We just need to preach the Word. No, no, you got to have it all to have it all. Hallelujah. There is no sum to Jesus. S-O-M-E. There's the sum of Jesus. S-U-M. The entirety. We don't pick and choose. Compromise looks like what we've been doing for my whole life in the church. We have a form of godliness and it looks great, but we deny the power. We deny the power that is in. So, hey, this, this did not occur. So, um, listen to this though. This is so good. Opposition through compromise. When San Ballot, I'm going to try to skip some of these long words, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and there was no breach in them, Though at that time I had not set up the doors upon the gates. Nehemiah had not yet set the doors upon the gates. Sam Ballot said, Come, let us meet together in some one of those villages in the plain of, Oh no, uh oh, oh no, hadn't put my door up yet. But they thought me to do mischief. And I sent messengers unto them saying, I'm doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? Yet they sent me four times after this, and I answered them the same manner. The same manner. It's a fight of faith. We can't just answer our sand ballot one time and say, No, I'm not coming and messing with you. I'm not coming and compromising. And then he just scurries away. No, no. Four times he came to me and I answered him in the same manner every time. Satan didn't tempt Jesus one time. He continued to come at him and come at him and come at him. Jesus continued the fight. He continued the fight of faith. He used the word of God as the sword. Breakfast and the word. Eat the word. Live the word. Let the word change me, Jesus. What has God called you to build? What has God called you to build that can house his glory? 
Nehemiah was building the temple so the glory of the Lord could be returned. Nehemiah was building the gates around the city so the protection of the Lord could return. What in your home and your family is left open, unguarded? What in your family spiritually does not have a door placed on it and shut? See, it says Sanballat knew they hadn't put the doors up, so he thought there was an open door. What open doors do you have or do I have that we need to build? Hallelujah, a structure in that place. Maybe it's through media. Maybe it's through what we watch on television, the way we speak, the way that we don't spend time with the Lord who is the door. So if Jesus is the door and he's not a part of my daily life, my every moment, hallelujah, he's so real, y'all. He's sitting right here. Look. I'm just giving you an illustration of how close Jesus is. He's sitting right here. He's right there with you. He's not distant. He did everything possible to prove his closeness to us. His spirit is inside of us. Yes, I'm aware of that. I'm not, I hope that you understand the metaphor that I'm trying to show you. He's just as close as if I could talk to him, as if he was sitting next to me. I can speak to him and I can hear from him and he's lovely and Jesus, I'll worship you. And Jesus, you are the door of protection. You are the protection. And so if you have a gaping hole in your life, or if I do, Jesus is the protection that we can have that sealed. Number six. So Nehemiah is doing good. He's just, he keeps fighting and keeps building and keeps fighting and keeps building. Hallelujah. I'm about to speak myself happy. Okay. The next one is opposition through slander, persecution. I mean, if he can't get us any other kind of way. And you know what I find, y'all? The people that are slandered or persecuted in our day are the ones that are really doing this thing. You see, they've made it through ridicule and they've made it through attack and they've made it through discouragement and they kept pressing and they made it through extortion trying to get them extorted and loving money that is a problem in the ministry and they got they kept pushing through compromise and now here comes the persecution so it's weird to me we don't see a lot of persecution real persecution but the ones that i do see that are facing it that are getting sued for what they're doing and death threats they've they're the fighters Persecution is a mark. Gosh, it's, it's a promise, actually. Not like a promise where you're like, oh, I'm excited. But he said, yeah, you will be persecuted. But, of course, we know. We know that didn't work on Nehemiah. I'm not going to read all that. So, I will read this one verse. This is Nehemiah 5 and verse 9, and it says, okay, so thanks, Joanne. I'm in Nehemiah 5 and verse 9. <laughs> We're on the same page, aren't we, girl? Nehemiah 5 and verse 9. And if you have a King James Version, you're going to see the actual titles. Opposition through ridicule, through threat of attack, through discouragement, through extortion, through compromise. And now we're on the one with slander. Slander. So, this is what Nehemiah says. For they all made us afraid, saying their hands shall be weakened from the work, that it will not be done. The enemy ever spoke to you or threw someone else towards you and say that, you know, this thing that you're trying to do, it's just, I don't think it's going to be good for you. It's going to be too much. It's going to crush you. I remember being in nursing school and someone telling me, there, girl, there's no way you can do that. I mean, I was a mother. Um... I got C's and D's in high school and just didn't really have the mental capacity in myself to be able to do anything that excelled. And I remember that word from them. Somehow or another, I took that word from them that I'm not going to be able to do it, and I turned it, and it pushed me through five and a half years of nursing school. Praise the Lord. And so take the words that the enemy speaks to you that you can't. How dare you think you could? You're just a mom. You're just a this. You're just a that. You've got everything else going on. And turn it and say, oh, yeah. Let me and Jesus show you what I can do when I'm walking in him. 
Let me and Jesus show you what's capable of a frail, messed up mama five that, that gets it wrong all the time, that fails all the time. But let me show you what she can do. Yeah, that, that person that you've seen stumble and stumble and stumble. Let me show you what she can do when she goes with Jesus. And then he says this, oh God, strengthen my hands. Everybody, put your hands like this, unless you're driving. Say, oh God, strengthen my hands. Say, oh God, strengthen my hands. Do it one more time. Say, oh God, strengthen my hands to war, to war. How do we war? Do we just scream at the devil and we're really mean and eh? No, this is how we war. This is how we war. I believe God, even though I do not feel it. Let me tell you, I'm not intimidated by whatever I see because what I see is going to burn up one day and his word is not. This is going to endure. So even though I can't see this in my physical eyes, the things I can see with my physical eyes are less real than what this says. So, of course, the slander didn't work. And the final one, opposition through treachery. Opposition through treachery. I'm just going to read this. Afterward, I came into the house of someone who was shut up, and he said, Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple, and let us shut the doors in the temple, for they will come to slay thee. Yea, in the night they will come to slay thee. And I said, Should such a man as I flee? Oh, treachery means that your very friends, your very family member, so if Satan can't get us through these other six things, he's going he's gonna to come as close as he can. These were people that were supposed to be helping Nehemiah. And they, and they said, come, let us meet. Let us meet in the house of God within the temple and let us shut the doors of the temple. So obviously they had accomplished some type of building at this point. For they're going to come and slay you. So it's the voice of Peter saying, surely, Jesus, you will not be crucified. That's this voice. It's the family member and the friend going, make yourself safe. Do what is safe. I care about you. Christianity is not safe, but it's the safest place that you can be. Oh, my goodness. I, 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 God does not call us to do things that are safe. Do you think that I would be on here doing this if, if, if he didn't call me? This isn't safe. This isn't safe at all. This is this is opening myself up to ridicule. This is not my personality, even though everyone seems to think that it is. It's not. Um, Christianity isn't safe. So you, you are protected. Now, that's if you could understand what I'm saying. He says, hey, scorpions, snakes, Satan, demons, they're going to come after you, but nothing shall by any means harm you. So in other words, you're not in a cushy, safe bubble because you're going to face attacks. But... Jesus, like the creator, like all the millions of demons, all of them are underneath him, his authority. He's the one that you're partnered with. So even, here's the deal. Even if I die, I'm safe. Do you get what I mean? The martyrs, they weren't safe. They were martyred, but they were safe in Christ. So opposition through treachery is someone coming to you and telling you, you need to do what's safe. Don't share about your beliefs on social media. That's not safe. And there's a big thing in our world right now about stay safe, stay safe, stay safe. And our whole focus has shifted from looking at ourselves as a whole, a spiritual being, to just the physical. Whatever you've got to do to keep your physical self safe, do it. And what the problem with that is, is when we're only focused, and I'm not into, um, like, I'm not into not walking in wisdom or common sense, but here's a problem. When my physical safety is the only thing I care about, I'm not going to obey Jesus. I'm not going to obey him. So with our, with our hype push on, um, with our hype push right now on safety, that I'm a nurse, of course I care about safety. I'm a mother, of course I care about safety. But when our entire focus is on safety, how will we ever jump, climb up on the wall and get a hammer in our hand and start building something that is offensive to the culture around us. 
How will we start building a house of worship, a house of prayer? How will we stand for what we believe when our focus is on remaining safe? I don't think that the disciples ever intentionally put their self in harm's way just to do it, but they often were found in harm's way preaching the gospel because they loved the people so much. They were willing to tell the truth even when the people hated them for it. Here we go. Okay. I'm almost done, y'all. I know this is going long. I was trying to do 15 minutes. Okay, I got to go. So this is so amazing. Joanne, amen. It wasn't safe to get out of the boat, but the safest place was to be right there on that storm with Jesus. So good. So good. Okay. Um, I love how Nehemiah said, should such a man as I flee? We have to get a little spiritual swagger. That's my southern way I say it. We have to get a little spiritual, uh, I don't know, just a, not a pride. It's really humility because I know me better than you. So I know all my shortcomings, all my issues. Oh my gosh, the, the war in here. And so with me knowing all that and in Christ standing tall and in the Holy Spirit standing strong and saying, should such a woman as I get off this wall to come and talk to you and try to be safe? Because the woman that I am is a woman of God. I've, I've, April has died in Christ. To live is Christ. My life is hidden in Christ. We live in Him. We move in Him. We have our being in Him. So should such a woman as I come down off this wall and flee? And who is there that being as I would go into the temple to save his life? Oh, Nehemiah. I love Nehemiah. Who such as I should get off this wall that God has told me to get up here and start building something, come down off this wall just to save my life, just to save my life. Wow. Let me say this. Should such a man as I come down off this cross to save my own life? Should such a man as I call down the multitude of angels to save me off this cross so that I should not die, so that I should be kept safe? No. God has given us a mission. God has given each one of us something to do in this earth, and we're going to die one day. You guys, will the wall that we were called to build be built, or will it still be rubble? Will we still be comfortable back there in Babylon serving the cup to the king, with our pillows and nice clothes and garments and all of the, the delicacies, or will we be in Jerusalem building the wall that God has called us to build? I bet you the food was better in Babylon. I bet you the sleep was better in Babylon. I know the comfort was, but he left his comfort zone to go and do what God had called him to do, to build the wall. And so you and I are called to do that as well. Jesus built a wall with the cross, and that wall, what it did is it put a protection around us. And it put us in the temple of God where we never had access before. We're protected by the wall he built. Now, your children need you to build a wall so they can be protected. Let me tell you something. My daughter is in high school and said that there is a teacher with a voodoo doll in her class that said it may never leave the school. If you do not think that spiritual warfare over your children is real, wake up. There are witches. There are warlocks. Anything in the kingdom of heaven, there's going to be that in the kingdom of darkness, the counterfeit. And they do go and try to put curses on regions and on schools and on homes and on neighborhoods. We have to wake up and start building a wall ourselves and start declaring not just over me. Let's get out of our desire to be selfish. Nehemiah wasn't doing this for himself. He was doing this for the people so they would have somewhere to come and worship God. We have to think about our children, our neighborhood, our community, our schools, our churches. And we have to begin to learn how to come up higher and not just pray surface level. Oh, Lord, help me pay this bill. But we have been seated with Christ in heavenly places in our spirit. So when we pray, we pray from that place and we look down on problems and we say, Lord, I speak over the CSRA, the Central Savannah River area, my region, and I declare over it freedom in Jesus' name and I break the power of Satan over it. We have to start praying like that. We're building a wall. We're fighting and building and fighting and building. How do we fight? Fight of faith. Fight of faith. Don't ever get it wrong thinking we fight in our own strength. We fight and we believe God. 
He says, should, should such a man as I, should such a man as I flee? And who is there that being as I would go up in the temple to save his life? I will not go in. I will not save myself. I will not spare myself. I will do what God has called me to do no matter how unsafe it makes me feel. Wherever I have to go, whatever I have to say, whatever I have to pray, however, uh, in the secret place. Let me tell you, a lot of this stuff happens in you and Jesus alone. Don't just wait to get in public to do this. You go and you drive into the secret place of prayer and you get to know him and get to know his voice. Listen to what he... Oh. God, you're so good. Get to know his voice is the last thing I said. Now look at this verse. God, when we spend time with Jesus, we have a discernment. Discernment. And lo, I perceived that God had not sent him. Now see, this was a friend of his. Somebody that's supposed to be helping. Saying, hey, come down off the wall. You're not safe. Let's go talk in the temple of God. Let's go have a prayer meeting. Sometimes we don't need a prayer meeting. Sometimes we need to get outside of the walls of the church and go do what God's called us to do. Woo! Okay. I perceived that God had not sent him, but that he pronounced this prophecy against me. Man, I'm going to have to preach a preaching series on this book. Some of your closest friends, when they speak over your life, you need to break that what is spoken. Literally, the man said, hey, they're trying to kill you. He was speaking a prophecy. He was cursing Nehemiah. And they'll say to you, you can't do this. You better, turn, you better bind that word. You better turn that thing around and say, watch me. Don't let people that you love speak curses over you. It says he was hired by Sanballat. Therefore, he was hired that I should be afraid and do so and sin. Whoa, hold on a minute. Do you mean if he came down off the wall, it would have been sin? Yes. Sin is not just smoking and drinking and the other things we think of. It is that too. <laughs> well, you know what I mean. I'm not trying to get into debate on drinking. Hear my heart. You know me better than that. But what I'm saying is it's not the outward things. If he got off the wall... That would have been sin. If you get off the wall, if I get off the wall, if we stop building and stop fighting, we are in sin. That is heavy. Because we just think sin is doing the wrong thing. But sin to God is not doing the right thing or rather the God thing. What God's called you to do, if you don't do it, it's sin. So we repent of not doing what God has called us to do. Lord, we turn away from that mindset. Therefore, he was hired that I should be afraid to do so and sin. And that they might have matter for an evil report. So the enemy wants to be able to get you to slip up. So that he can say, look what April did. But my God... Think thou upon Tobiah and Sambalat according to their works and the rest, okay, that they would try to put me in fear. And then the next heading is completion of the restoration. Isn't the Bible beautiful? It's almost like it was just inspired by God, and it was. I want to bless you today in the name of the Lord. I want to tell you that whatever God's called you to build, He's equipped you already. You've got everything you need. Don't wait. My friend's got this new thing God gave her that's called Just Go period, burn, period. Just go, period, burn, period. I love y'all. Um, I hope your heart's been stirred, and I'll talk to y'all later.